Welcome to Maine's model of school supports, Tier 2 Schools Identified and FY 2022-2023 pre-recording for those schools that were identified in the FY 22 and 23 school year. This recording is taking place in August of 2024 and is being presented by Continuous School Improvement. My name is Monique Sullivan, and I am the Continuous School Improvement Coordinator for the department. Although I am listed under ESEA, I work with the assessment team under Maine's model of school supports, which falls under several sections of the ESSA statute, but specifically Title I, Section 1111, and Section 1003. Before starting with the content of this pre recording, I wanted to review very quickly the mission, the vision, and the strategic priorities of the Maine Department of Education. These are the driving forces behind all the work that we do at the department. The outcomes for today's pre-recording technical assistance webinar are to understand identification status, understand how to access and review school profiles, understand requirements of tier two TSI school improvement plans and next steps for FY24-25. To begin, we're going to talk about identification, the cycle, exit criteria and notifications. So the identification cycle, Maine's model of school support is run every year, but identifications are made every year for tier two TSI, every three years for tier three CSI, and every six years for tier one ATSI. Schools remain in, in identified status until exit criteria is met or conversion to another status happens. Schools are typically eligible to exit their identification status after, three year after a three year cycle. Schools may also convert to another status after three years. You will see with, um, with the future slides that it really does take three years to exit criteria, to exit a status because of the exit criteria required for each of the statuses. To begin, I wanted to review the identification statuses that were made in FY 22 and 23. There were seven uh, notifications, there were seven identifications that were made last year in, um, in FY 22, 23, or over a year ago. So to begin with, uh, we had tier threes that were not able to exit they continued to receive tier three support in FY 23 and 24. There were four, 49 of those. The reason why there's per USDOE directive is because these schools in FY 22, 23 did not meet the tier three exit, um, did not meet the tier three identification criteria, but per USDOE directive, um, the department was not permitted to exit any tier three schools because the department was in the middle of calibrating an assessment, the new the NUIA uh, assessment, um, which was norm referenced. And over the summer of 2023, the department of the main department of education was calibrating to make the May through year assessment um, criterion referenced. So we also had and we also had re-identified tier three schools. And these were schools when the model was run, they were still meeting the criteria for tier three identification status. So therefore they continue to receive tier three support in the FY23-24 school year. And those are, there were 20 of those. Tier three, newly these were schools that were newly identified. They met the tier three criteria, but were provided no tier three support because they were outside the 5% per mains model of school support plan which is 45. There were 45 of those schools. Now, Maine's model school supports plan, those student, those um, schools that were re-identified for supports, that's the, the second identification status here. And the 5%, those were schools that were in, when the model was run the first time in 1819, these schools uh, had the, met the criteria. And then in 22, 20, and then moving on, um, so they were identified as the 5%. And number four, tier two, 
these are schools. This is what this recording is geared toward. This is the focus of this pre-recording, and it's for the tier two schools that were identified per USDO directive. And I'll explain what that means um, in a future slide. And that is um, to be to the USDOE required us to make identifications for tier two, um, 86, there were 86 of those schools and we were required to by USDOE um, to make those. And I'll explain a little bit later what that means. And then just for further information, there were 77 schools that were tier one just like the tier three that were not able to exit, they did not meet um, the criteria for tier one identification, but you per USDOE directive, we the department was not permitted to exit any of those. And then number six, tier one, there were newly identified 32. These were schools that met the tier one criteria and they had not been identified in 18, 19, like the number five tier ones, not able to exit. Um, and then tier one, these were schools that were initially tier one in 18, 19, and they continued to meet the tier one criteria, identification criteria in 22, 23, and they were labeled as re-identified and there were 37 of those. And um, just wanna let everyone know that in May of 2023, uh, fiscal letters were mailed to the SAUs, um, notifying them of the schools the schools in their SAUs that had been identified for a stat for a status underneath Maine's model of school supports. So I've heard from many districts, they don't know, they never got these letters, they never got these notifications, they don't know where to find them for a variety of reasons. So I put here on how to access. Um, so all of these um, notifications, the school profiles and the identification letters were um, put uploaded into the FY24 ESA consolidated application under the SAU document library. You can go to the FY24 ESA consolidated application for your SAU and you can click on SAU documents library. You can hit general. You want to take it's a plus sign. You click it and make it night and hit the plus sign and then you go to ESA documents and then you click on that and you should see Maine's model of school support and accountability. And this lists all of the identification letters and the school profiles. Moving forward to this past year that we just finished, um, the FY23-24, identifications were uh, made again. And typically the department would not make identifications back to back. As you can see, we, but because of USDOE directive, we were required to do so. <laughs> so um, just the tier three able to exit. Um, we had 13 that were able to exit their tier three status because they did not have all their student populations uh, meeting tier three criteria. And this is the group here that we had 49. So 49 in 22, 22 23, 13 of those 49 were able to exit. Um, in 23, 24. Uh, additionally, out of those 49, we had 23 schools that were able to exit tier three, but they still had at least one student population that was experiencing challenges. So they they um, they lost their tier three or they exited their tier three, but they now um, went to their tier one. Uh, and then tier three, unable to exit. These were schools, these were of the 49, there were 13 that were not, um, they were able to exit, but they did not meet the exit criteria. So they will continue in tier three status for the FY24-25 school year. And then tier three, these were schools that were not eligible to exit um, because they had been, um, they had been identified in 22-23 as re-identified. And so they need two more years to be able to exit and meet the exit criteria. And then without support, these were schools that were identified in 22-23. They were outside the 5%, but technically they were still tier three and they still have to finish and complete their cycle and meet the exit criteria. Five, tier three, these were newly identified tier three schools, and, uh, and there were 18 of those. 
And then lastly, of the tier threes, we have students that, um, we have schools that were identified and they met the criteria, for identification criteria for tier three and FY23, but they were outside the 5% to receive tier three additional supports, uh, that they are still considered to be tier three and the, there are 29 of those. Now seven, this again, this is what this recording is focused on, is the tier two schools that were identified in 22-23. Um, we were required to make identifications for tier two. So this, this is the same number of schools as um, in 22-23 and 23-24. We did not make new tier two uh, identifications because um, there was not enough data um, to make those decisions, to make those identifications. And tier one, able to exit um, out of those schools, out of, out of the 77 schools that were not able to exit tier one in 22 and 23, 35 of them were able to exit. They had no student populations that were experiencing challenges. Um, number nine, we had 69 that um, were not able, were unable to exit and did not meet the exit criteria. And then tier one, these uh, not eligible to exit, these were schools that they just didn't have enough uh, data, enough years of data to be able to uh, be eligible to exit, which are 55. And then tier one, these were newly identified tier one schools in 23, 24. And again, typically we wouldn't make identifications back to back, but the US, Department of Education required us to make identifications in 22-23. And then because our assessment had been recalibrated and was considered to be um, almost like a new assessment in, uh, for 23-24, uh, uh, the Department of Education, U.S. Department of Education, required us to make identifications back to back. Moving forward, it should only be three years for uh, one year for tier two, three years for tier three, and six years for tier one. So again, just to get into a little more detail about the identification, uh, this recording is again for those schools that were identified in FY22, 23 as tier two schools. One or more student populations have experiencing challenges for the same indicators for three years. These schools or the, the audience uh, for this recording will be eligible to exit tier two status after three years. Typically it takes three years to exit a status, especially for like tier two, because tier two, the exit criteria requires not having the same student populations experience challenges in the same indicators for three years. So 22, 23 would have been the yes, and then you would need two, three no's. Um, so in, 22, 23, 24, you would have to have a no, and then you'd have to have two more no's to be able to exit. The options are when you get to those, after those three years, you can exit tier status, tier two status with no support. That means you have no student populations experiencing challenges across all the indicators. You could exit two status, um, exit tier two status with tier one ATSI support. That means you have one or more different populations that are experiencing challenges across the L indicators. And you could stay at tier two if different student populations have experienced challenges for the same indicators for three years. Or you could convert to a tier three status, which means all your student populations are experiencing challenges across all indicators, or the same student populations that rendered the tier two status are still experiencing challenges in the same indicators after three years. Now, I just wanna talk a little bit about school profiles um, and the ESSA dashboard. So the S, this is the public facing ESSA dashboard, and this is where you will find the statutory requirements to post information about schools in regarding to, in regarding Maine's model school sports and the accountability indicators. When we made the notifications this year in FY23-24, or this past year we just finished a few months, a couple months ago, we provided in the notifications to our newly identified schools that we created a web page link or a Tableau site 
where school can go in and they can find more information about their student populations and how they did on the assessments. This is not a website where you're gonna go, you drill down to the student level. It's more of the student population level. You would have to go to your NWA or Acacia to be able to get more specific student um, specific data. But in the school profile, you'll see the school profile, there's end counts, their identification over time, graphs, achievement goals, and math. So what I did here was you do need to look at two school profiles to determine a tier two status, or you actually need to look at three years of data. The U.S. Department of Education, to try to make this short, uh, the Department of the main Department of Education wanted to wait until 23 and 24 to make identifications for tier two. But the U.S. Department of Education said, no, we were required to make tier two identifications last year in 22, 23. And that's why you only see two school profiles here, because we did not have three years worth of data. We only had two. Uh, because we did not assess for two years because of COVID. And then on the third year, we didn't assess because we had started a new, uh, we had uh, implemented a new assessment, which was NWA or NOEA, um, which is now transitioned into main three-year assessment. But if you look at this profile, you can see at 1819, this uh, school had students, had several, had several, had um, had two student populations that were my, not meeting um we're not meeting the, um, the standards or we're actually meeting the criteria for tier three. And if you go to the economically disadvantaged students, you can see that they had um, a red for chronic absenteeism. So that's the first part of the equation. And then as you move across, they did fine. They did great in, in um, ELA, but they, worked, they had two reds in the math and therefore that was a student group or student population that was experiencing challenges. I just want to back up a second and I want to say to you that this part on the top where it says emerging, developing, 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 and emerging, this is the part that is on the Maine's Model School Support, the public facing ESSA dashboard. This part on the bottom, which talks about the individual student population groups, that is not required to be posted on a public facing as a dashboard, but we wanted our schools to be able to see this information. And so this information um, is a, uh, a web link, which I or web page link that I will provide in my notification when this recording is ready. Um, and I will send that out through grants for me notification system. I will have the link to the YouTube recording and also a copy of the slide deck. But students with disabilities, um, they also were a group uh, or student population that was experiencing challenges in 1819. And so I have this highlighted because if you go over to 2223 and economically disadvantaged, they are not. Um, they did not experience challenges. Yes, they were chronically absent. That, that was an area of 10% 10, 10 or more. But for um, the for ELA, they were not experiencing challenges because when you go to the equation, it needs to be progress and achievement and they didn't have both. So that would not have rendered anything. And then they, when we got to, when they went to math, when we go to math, they have a check mark and an accelerating. So again, so this is not what rendered the tier two status. What rendered the tier two status was students with disabilities because two years in a row, they have had Reds they've had um, not met. So this is what render the tier two status in 22-23. Now I circled um, two or more races and white student populations because technically they, if this group hadn't, students with disabilities hadn't had that, this school would have been um, identified um, as tier one. Now I do want to take a step back that uh, all tier two and all tier three schools are actually tier one. But the way our model works is we go with kind of the the most the um, the identification status that would render the most support. Um, and then once that top level goes down, then you just it's kind of like a, a, a if you think of a filter, right? We go to the top and then we filter down. So, but it is something to think about that you know. So when we fast forward to twenty three twenty four. If any of these student populations are continuing to have uh, to struggle or to have um, experiencing challenges, that would be something to think about.
So moving to the 2324 uh, school profile, which you will be able to find when you receive the uh, web link or the Tableau site. So students with disabilities is still red. So, and the white student population is still experiencing challenges. And we have another group, uh, economically disadvantaged, which was experiencing challenges, um, was experiencing challenges in 1819. So they, they weren't experiencing challenges in 22, 23, but they are experiencing challenges again in 23, 24. So that is something to think about. Um, if we did make tier two identification criteria or made identifications again, um, this school would not exit tier two, would not exit uh, tier two status because they don't meet the criteria because you need three years of not having the same student population with the same indicators. Um, and then um, it could convert to a tier three potentially because after three years, if a school is still tier two for the same student population, then they could uh, convert to a tier three. Um, again, though, uh, if you're looking at the white, that could get a school identified for tier two if there's another, a third year where they're not, where they are experiencing challenges. And the economically disadvantaged could have the school identified for tier one. So there's all these pieces to consider. I do want to stop for a second and just talk about chronic absenteeism. Um, I've had a lot of schools tell me that it's chronic absenteeism. That's what's rendering our identification status. That is a yes and a no. Yes, chronic absenteeism starts the equation, as you can see right here. This is, um, and chronic absenteeism is based on what SAUs report. So if an SAU it's all based on the daily uh, the, the attendance that is reported um, from the school. So it's it's not data that the Department of Education um, creates or calibrates. This is information that comes directly from reported information that comes directly from SAUs. And as you can see, if all you had was the um, chronic absenteeism, but you didn't meet the both of these criteria for academic for ELA, you didn't meet both of these criteria for uh, math, then it wouldn't be experiencing challenges. And then the end count just gives you an idea of how many students participated in the assessment and uh, across all the student populations. Uh, graphs give you a visual of what the um, what the assessment results came up with. And then achievement goals. This is to tell you how a school should do over time um, to meet the expected achievement goals. Now, I do want to stop and make a note that the achievement goals is based on actual student data. The school profile information is based on the uh, state average. When, because we recalibrated the assessment, um, we needed to have a baseline. So they created just uh, a state average for the achievement growth and the achievement data and the achievement is based on the state. So the school profile in this slide right now is based on state average. That's what the school profile, that was what the identification status was based on for 23, 24. Now, moving forward, the achievement goals will be based on the individual school data. But this particular image is already based on individual school data. And so that's why it looks different. The percentages are different and the numbers are different than what is in the, uh, the school profile. So that is why there's a difference. Getting a lot of questions about that. And then there's the indicators over time. This in identifications over time. This tells you how the school did um, in relation to the different tiers. So again, in 1819 was the first year we identified schools under this model. Eight, 1920 was um, and 2020 was COVID, and then 21, 22 we created a new we had a new assessment. 
And in tier three, the school, and in 22, 23, and in 23, 24, the school did not uh, meet tier three identification criteria. They did meet it in yet um, in 22, 23, but remember they need three no's to be able to exit tier three status. And then ATSI or tier one, remember every school, if they're tier three or tier two is also a tier one. And you can see that over time. Um, there's also the map. And uh, this kind of gives you an idea of where schools are in the state and how many are tier two, how many are tier three, just to give schools an idea of what how other schools are across the state. And then this is the last part of this recording. It's called the School Improvement Plan and its requirements and monitoring. So there are requirements set forth for targeted school improvement um, schools and a targeted school improvement plan is required. Um, it's supposed to be created in partnership with stakeholders, uh, principals, school leaders, teachers, and parents, has to be developed with, has to be developed and implemented at a school level, um, level and it needs to be school level targeted support and improvement plan. It should be based on the indicators that rendered the status, which are in the statewide accountability system. Um, evidence-based interventions, you need to have at least one evidence-based intervention implemented. The plan needs to be approved by the SAU, monitored by the SAU, and the SAU needs to provide more support if the plan doesn't work. So this is why the school profiles are really important because you can go and see which indicators, you can start with that point and drill down and see um, and build your plan around that. So in summary, the school improvement requirements, the plan must be developed by a stakeholder groups in partnership, has to have be informed by all the indicators and main state accountability system, and needs to include one or more evidence-based interventions. Now, that being said, if a school already operates a Title I school-wide program, they already need to have a school-wide plan. So if your school already has a school-wide plan and you're here because you are identified, or you're listening to this because you are watching this because you are, you are a tier two school, you can use your Title I school-wide plan to meet this requirement. You just wanna make sure that your school-wide plan includes all the SI plan requirements and is updated. If your school operates a Title I targeted program, then your school district or your SAU has to have a comprehensive needs assessment for the entire district. And that comprehensive needs assessment needs to include all the schools in the district and an assessment of what their needs are. And that plan needs to address those school level needs. You can use this uh, SAU CNA, as long as you include the identified schools and that the part of the CNA that addresses the needs of those identified schools uh, includes um, the SI plan requirements. Now, for those of you who do not operate a Title I program, targeted or school wide, you may have a strategic plan that you're using. Um, but we do have a template on the main department of education and comprehensive needs assessment that you can use as well. But you wanna make sure that your plan beats the school um, improvement requirements for tier two identified schools. Just wanna note that all documentation will need to be at the school site. Nothing needs to be submitted to the main DOE unless requested. And the school improvement, school improvement will be included in the FY24-25 ESCA consolidated monitoring. So I just want to make sure everybody knows this and keep your documentation because if your SAU is selected for monitoring um, in this year 24-25, then you will be asked, or your school, your SAU will be asked to submit all school improvement plans for any and all identified schools. So if there are any tier one schools if there are any tier two schools, and if there are any tier three schools, they will be they will have to submit their school improvement plan. And lastly, the SAU just would I'm asking the SAUs add the role LEA tier two principal for all their tier two schools principals in their address book in the FY25 ESA consolidated application. There is no real quick and easy way to get out communication and notifications to our tier 
two principles. And so this is a way that we can do that. So I had this role set up in the ESA consolidated application to be able to send out quick notifications um, to schools. Now I know it says tier three here, but all of the notifications for tier one, tier two, and some of our tier three who don't have SIG applications, it'll go through this venue, the grants for me. So you wanna get your LEA, user access administrator, to go into the FY24, sorry, FY25 ESA consolidated application and have them set up these roles, um, the LEA tier two principal role. And also if you have an LEA, if you have a tier one or tier three principal that does not uh, get a SIG application. Um, it's really important, like this recording and the slide deck will be, uh, that notification will go through grants for me. And then if you do want to look at the Maine's model of school support uh, for the hierarchy of identification status, um, you can find this on our Maine Department of Education. If you go to the accountability web part page, you'll see the um, most up-to-date version of Maine's model of school support. And we do have resources and opportunities. Uh, there, is our, there is a professional development calendar at the department that lists all the professional development opportunities. The main, um, any school that's identified for school improvement, tier one, tier two, or tier three, is eligible to participate in Maine Department of Education sponsored professional learning at no cost. No cost means that the department will pay or cover the registration cost for Maine Department of Education sponsored professional learning or professional development. Any other related costs like mileage or salaries for work um, for teachers outside of contracted hours or hotel or lodging or uh, food, all that will need to be um, funded with other sources. And then contact our team. Here's my email and my phone number. I do want to say that I am much better at um, responding to email than I am phone calls. I'm usually in the middle of meetings or working on projects. So a lot of times if you send me an email, say, hey, can we, can we meet up? I'll be sure and I'll set up a time and that will be a dedicated time for us to chat about whatever your questions or concerns are. If you have physical questions, you can reach out to Tyra Corson. And then the chief of federal programs is Jeanette Kirk. And lastly, if you want to stay connected with the Maine Department of Education, here are all the different ways to do that. And again, this is recording is for those schools that were identified for tier two uh, supports in FY22-23, and they continue into this status for the 24-25 school year. And please reach out to me if you have any questions, and thank you.